church, whether you're here in person or you're watching on Facebook, I want to take a moment to thank the Allen and the Praise Band and Mark Tober for the wonderful job they did last Sunday night for us at Charge Conference. They really had the congregation going, and I think they deserve a big hand for all they do every week. So, thank you. Um, next Saturday night is the um, truck or treat at Speedway High School uh, from 5 to 6.30. Sherry still needs lots of candy, so if you can get it over here before Saturday. Uh, we have two spots over there, so we want to show the community that we are you know, we want to be known and that we want to um, help the kids and we might have some special visitors. So if you can help bring candy over this week, please do so. Um, okay. Oh, um, kid, our volunteers are needed to pass out candy at the child care at the annex next Friday the 28th at 9.30. So if you can come, please let Becky know. Also, um, on November 2nd at 9.30, we're going to start working in the library, going through and straightening it up and doing some house cleaning. So if anyone can come over and help, please plan to come over. Um, Sherry also needs any additional names for the All Saints Sunday, which is coming up. And um, while you're, I know it seems like it's a long way off, but Christmas is coming pretty quick. So when you start doing your Christmas shopping, you can also help the church. If you go in on Amazon and order any gifts, if you go into smileamazon.com and then put our church name in every quarter for any money that is spent, our church um, gets a check for that, which helps for our expenses. So. Babe, you can do that. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you.
So take a breath this morning. Take a deep breath. And breathe in that Holy Spirit. As we stand and sing together today, better is one day in your house, Lord. Better is one day in your courts than anywhere else on earth. So take a deep breath and sing a praise this morning. I will draw near to you. 
to you. Better is one day in your better is one day in your house, better is one day. Yes, better is better is one day in your court, better is one day in your house, better is one day and a thousand elsewhere. Amen. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 The psalmist said, I was glad what they said unto me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. My soul rejoices to be among God's people, to worship. Amen. Just to be the worship. I don't know if you've ever experienced true worship or if you ever opened your spirit to true worship. But when you just lift your hands, and sometimes, you know, you can't even say a word. It, it's a silent worship. And then sometimes it's a, it's a loud hallelujah. Oh, just to be in your presence, Lord. It's better than being anywhere else. It's better than being anywhere else. Amen. I'd rather be in the house of my God. Hallelujah. Than to be anywhere else. This morning, before we go to prayer, I got a request of you that you're in the house of God this morning. How many of you got a cell phone? All right. How many of you got a Facebook page? All right. I, have to, I need you to pick out your phone. Come on, get your phone. Get your phone out. Get your phone. Get your phones out. Okay, you do your phones all out time. Most of the time when I'm preaching, right? Get your phones out. Amen? And, and, and go to your Facebook page and post where you are today. You, you're in the courts of the Lord. You're in the house of God. You are at Speedway United Methodist Church. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here. I Well, somebody, somebody said an amen. I'm glad to be here in the courts of the Lord, in the house of our God, where we can worship him in spirit and in truth. Our God is awesome, and he's worthy to be praised. So text all your friends. Tell all your Facebook friends. Tell everybody you know. It's better to be in the house of the Lord just one day, just for an hour, for a moment to be in the courts of the Lord. Lift your hearts and to lift your hands. Whatever burden you may feel today, whether affliction that you might have, whatever's on your heart this morning, we can bring it before the Lord. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace that we might obtain grace and have mercy in a time of need. And whatever your need is, for those who are watching us online, for whatever your need is, well, the point of contact this morning is not just what you're watching online, but the point of contact this morning is your faith. Amen. It's your faith. And we are overcomers this morning through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So I testify this morning that I am redeemed. I testify this morning that I am saved. I testify this morning that I am healed, that I am made whole. I testify this morning that I am in the courts of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise be to you, Jesus. Praise be to you, Almighty Father. We worship you this morning. We love you. We adore you. And we give praise and thanks and blessing. Oh God, unto you, most high God. You are our God and we are your people, the sheep of your pastor, oh God, the apples of your eye. We are yours and you are ours, our God. We thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you for the gathering of your people. We thank you for the power of your spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the day, for this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice in this day. A day of your goodness, a day of your salvation, a day of your blessing, Lord. We are so glad to be in your house. We're so glad, oh God, to be able to our hands to raise our voice oh God to move about ourselves oh God with feet and and just worship you in holiness and in righteousness and it's not because we're deserving oh God it's not because that we are all that but because of what you have done in the sacrifice of your son Lord Jesus on the cross for us you delivered us from shame and guilt and all affliction God you are our God we 
triumph in you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the gathering of your people. We thank you for the power of your spirit. We only ask this morning, Lord, that you be glorified in this place, that your name be exalted, that you be exalted on high. We lift you, oh God, in praise and adoration. We offer to you a thanksgiving of praise and a hand clap of praise throughout the building this morning. Glory be to our God. Hallelujah. 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 We lift you up, Lord. Yes. We bless your name. Pray this morning, oh God, as you taught us to pray. We honor you this morning as we make mention of those who are in need for, for Ron Long this morning. And for Jan Holger this morning and her family who's passed away. Lord, may you by your power grant, oh God, your comforting of the Holy Spirit. We ask God for your blessing upon all those who are sick and afflicted and even those, oh God, who are suffering, believers who are suffering all over the world, the persecuted ones, oh God, for the faith. When the body of Christ is hurting, God, we all hurt. And our hearts bleed this morning, Lord God, for those who are in Ukraine and Russia and all over the world and in Africa and Asia and wherever your people are be, they're bowing down before you and they're calling out to you, God, for deliverance. We pray the power of Christ may be upon them. We pray the Holy Spirit might touch all of us this very day. We pray, O oh God, as you taught us to pray. Let us now say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 God is good. All the time. All right. All right. Now turn to somebody and bless them in the name of the Lord. Just extend a blessing. Amen. To your neighbor this morning. Because you're in the house of the Lord. Better is one day. Hallelujah. Than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than a thousand elsewhere, a thousand elsewhere. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. God is good. Amen. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. Hallelujah. So we're delighted this morning. I hope that you have a Follow the instructions this morning and text somebody or told somebody you're here or post it on your Facebook page. Amen. Amen. I have another request of you this morning. Uh, so this is this, 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 uh, seven days uh, in one week. Wow, Pastor, that's a revelation. <laughs> yeah, right, right, Sherlock here. Uh, and we're going to ask a, a favor of all you who are members this morning and even those of you who are online. Uh, we have these cards. Uh, come and experience worship Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. The Speedway United Methodist Church. They'll be on the table in the back. So I'm going to challenge you this week. Take five cards, five little cards. And when you go to the grocery store and somebody is in the aisle, you just walk up and hand him one. You don't even have to have a conversation. Good afternoon. Uh, nice to see you shopping today. I would just like to extend to you this invitation. You don't have to say anything else. If you want to say something else, that's good. If you find yourself in the doctor's office this week, huh? Maybe your neighbor, you know, the one that sees you going to church on Sunday, but, you know, you never talk to them. <laughs> well, maybe you want to leave it in their mailbox, but it would be better if you put it in their hand. You know? And extend an invitation to someone, to the house of God. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God? Do you think somebody else would like to be in the house of God? I mean, you know, it, it might be more fun for them to, you know, watch a race on Sunday or go bowling. Uh, but since the football game has not started yet, I think, you know, <laughs> we'll be out by that time, right? Okay. 
So the challenge is for all of our members, and as well as you online this uh, day, you know, you can, you can, you though online, you can post that on your Facebook or five of your friends and say to them, hey, check out uh, Speedway United Methodist Church next Sunday at 10 a.m. In fact, you, you can do it now. <laughs> Those of you online, check them out. And we will gladly welcome all visitors to the house of God to worship because God is awesome. And, and his love is, oh, off the chart. Amen? Amen. Amen. So remember that. You know, th here's the challenge. What's the challenge? Just five. It's only it's only seven days, okay? But you got five. So I'm gonna, you got two days in there to play around. You know, get, get five cards, pick up five cards, and extend an invitation uh, to the house of God. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Pastor's going to do it too. I can't ask you to I do something to. I don't do. All of us. All right. Praise God. Let's continue worship. Can you join me in the reading of our Psalter? And our worship theme from the psalm is the longing for God's house, psalm, from Psalm 84. As we just sang, better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. And, well, there's no misprints in the Bible, but maybe they meant millions elsewhere. I'm not sure. Yes. That could be possible. I yes. Understand. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the course of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Yes. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she places her young near your altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Salah. O Lord, God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed one. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere else. I would I'd rather stand, stand at the threshold, threshold of the house, house of my God than to live in the tents of wicked people. For the, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord armies, happy are those who trust in you. So this psalm has ended with a couple of God's wonderful, wonderful promises. Thank you, Lord, for your word and your promises. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. 
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Worthy is your name. Hallelujah. And bring forth the royal diadem. Crown him Lord of all. King of kings and Lord of all. Amen. That's who he is. Amen. Amen. King of kings and Lord of all. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. All the time. Amen. 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 Well, will you join me this morning as we look to the meditation of our scripture today? The title of the meditation uh, deals with these three things, prayer, pride, and humility, coming to us out of Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, and the key verse to the passage is verse 14. Will you stand with me while we read the gospel of Luke this morning? And we will read it in unison as it appears before us on the screens. He also told, told a parable to some who trusted, trusted in themselves in that they were righteous and regard others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, God I, thank I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, thieves rogues, adulterers, and even, even like this tax collector. I, I fast, fast twice a week. week. I, I give a tenth, tenth of all, all my income. income. But the, the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast, his breast and saying, God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will, will be, be humble, but all who humble, humble themselves will be, will be exalted. exalted. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the reading of the word of God and the hearing of the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing of the word of God. We only ask this morning, Father, that you would endow us with an ear to hear, a heart to receive, a mind to perceive all that you have for us in the narrative of this text this morning. May the enemy of our soul, O oh God, be bound. May the word of God have free course in our lives. May the scripture fall on the good ground and may it bring forth fruit. God, that we might be pleased in your sight, living, O oh God, vessels of your glory. We ask this in the name of Christ and we give praise and honor to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord again. And he spake a parable. Uh, unto certain uh, that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, according to the King James. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Listen with your spirit. New Revised uh, Standard Version, updated, uh, starts off with this words, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collectors, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you that this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who are exalted or all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. extended amplified version of the same text. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, posing outward as upright and in right standing with God and who viewed others with contempt. Two men went into the temple enclosed to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood ostentatiously and began praying to himself in a self-righteous way saying, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unjust, dishonest, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing at a distance would not raise his eyes toward heaven but of striking his chest in humility and repentance, saying, God, be merciful and gracious to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you, this man went to his home justified, forgiven of the guilt and sin, and placed in right standing with God, rather than the other man. For everyone who extols or exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself, forsaking self-righteousness or self-righteous pride, will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. So our meditation this morning deals with prayer, pride, and humility. And just from the reading of the text, I think I can just go back and take my seat seems to be self-explanatory. I mean, if you, don't, if you don't get the essence of the message, you, either you're blind, deaf, or you just don't care. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he constantly is teaching them about life. He is constantly making this assumption, or, 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 or I shouldn't say assumption, he's constantly making these, these lessons that they should learn just about their own discipleship. How many of you are a disciple of Christ? I'm a disciple of Jesus. You want to put it in modern terms? I'm, I'm Jesus' protege. I, I want to be like him. I want to think like him. I want to do what he does, say what he says. I want people to see Christ in my life. I really want to be called a Christian. It, it's a biblical term. It's, it comes out of the book of Acts. It was, it was those people in the book of Acts that were in the town of Antioch in that, in that city. Uh, that group of believers were called Christians because they act like Christ. And so if we're really going to act like Christ, we, we have to listen to the things he said. As, as we said last week, th that place of prayer and posture is sitting at the feet of Jesus. If we can ever get to the place where we can just hear what Jesus said discovering as a pastor and as a, a person of gospel preaching that what's most important in the narrative of the biblical text is not what I say, it's what Jesus says. It's not even what the Apostle Paul says or, or either one of the other disciples who, who wrote their letters and the epistles. I mean, they're important. Don't misunderstand me. The Old Testament is important as well as the New Testament. But when we have the words of Jesus, they supersede all words ever. Prayer is the subject. And the place that they're going to, the geographical place, is the temple. They are going to the temple to pray. And, and now, now, you know, I told you last week that you can always pray. And it doesn't matter where you are, what circumstances you find yourself in, wherever or whatever it may be, you can always, always, always pray. You can always tell God about it. In fact, I, I encourage you, always tell God about it. I mean, we, we call up everybody and tell them about it. We might even stop a total stranger and tell them about it. You ever run into a person, they're telling you all about your problems? You're like, why are they telling me all of this? You know, some people you, you, you avoid because if you ask them how they're doing, they're going to give you a list of things. I got this pain, that pain. You know, I got this surgery coming. and that, I mean, they will give you a list. And then there are others that you will ask, oh, fine. You know things are not fine. 
We, we get caught in this thing that, that we really don't want to listen to one another, but you can always tell the Lord, our God, how you feel and what's going on. Prayer. They went to the place to pray. They went to the temple. And even though you can pray everywhere, it is essential that you pray in the house of God. In the house of God. It, it, the reason why it's essential, let me, let, let, let me break this down to you. So, so David was the king, and, and, and as he came to power, Saul was disposed as king by God. By the way, God fired Saul, but, you know, he lasted about two more years. God could fire you. You're not even know it, did you? Just, but God fired him. <laughs> And David becomes the king, and, 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 and his, his heart for God, now he was not a perfect man, even though the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. He was not a perfect man. He had a lot of issues. Yes. He wanted to build God a place, a house. In fact, he says to the prophet, he says, you know, I live in a house of cedar, and, 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 and the ark of God, which was a symbol of God's presence for Israel, the ark of the covenant of God, and, and, and the covenant of God was in there, and the, and, and the tablets that Moses gave them, and, and the showbread, and all those things were, were confined in that ark. That very symbol of God's presence was, was in a tent out in the field. David said, I, I need to build God a house. And the prophet says, do, do what's up in your heart. It, it seems good. And God had another answer. David, you cannot build me a house. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. So, so what you're going to do, David, you're going to make preparation for your son to build me a house. Solomon, your son will build me a house. And Solomon built this beautiful, beautiful house for God. He built a place of worship. And he prays in, in, in the sixth chapter of Second Chronicles. He has a prayer that he begins. And, and, and I, I can't even begin to read to you all the prayer, but I want to just give you an essence. He basically says, when your people pray, see, because he didn't build a house particularly for God, because here's what Solomon says, the heavens and the heavens cannot contain you. God even says, I never asked anybody to build me a house. I, ever since I called the children of Israel out of Egypt, I have never asked any of you to build me a house. In fact, there is no house. Speedway United Methodist Church, with all of its square footage, cannot contain God. And all the churches in Indianapolis cannot contain God. And all the churches in Indiana cannot contain God. All the churches in America cannot contain God. God, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. And God says, where is the house where I will rest? So Solomon says in the narrative of his text, I am not building God a house. I'm building a place for his name. And, and he prays this prayer. God, whenever we come to this place and call on your name, the place where your name is hallowed, that is the purpose of the church. I mean, we do a lot of things in church, but the real purpose of the church is to be a hallowed place for the name of God. That's the purpose. And, and by the way, that's just the building. Because <laughs> we consider that the church. But really the church, the church is you and you, and you that are watching online and me, the church is God's people. They are the people that's called out for his name, to hallowed his name. And he says, whatever, whatever those people come here, whenever they are here, God, will you listen and will you respond to the cry? And whatever they do, if even if they sin against you, by the way, he says, there's no man sinneth not. I like the words of the Apostle Paul who says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. You know, most people not vying for that first seat, you know, <laughs> not me. I want to be at the back of that line. I mean, I'm not as bad as the other guy. Well, let me tell you, you're still a sinner. Well, pastor, I, I don't sell drugs. You're still a sinner. Well, pastor, I'm not a prostitute. You're still a sinner. Well, Pastor, I, do, I, you know, I treat everybody right. You're still a sinner. I've never committed. I got the, the top ten of God. I never committed adultery. I don't use his name in vain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You are still a sinner because we're all born in this atomic sense of sin in our lives. It's in our bloodstream. It's in our DNA. We are sinners. And the only difference in the people of God and the people who are not of God is we are sinners saved by his grace. Hallelujah. The one thing I like about the Methodist Church, and I usually don't preach denominations, but somebody asked me why I'm on a Methodist. You know, I started off as a Baptist, joined the Pentecostals, have worshipped with the Lutherans and the Catholics. I've worshipped with them all. But why do you Methodists? Well, let me tell you why I'm a Methodist. Because they have this grace thing down packed. 
They got this grace thing because it's all about God's grace. You cannot live good enough. You cannot be good enough. You cannot be righteous within yourself. In fact, the Bible says our righteousness is as a filthy rag. You cannot be righteous within yourself, but what you can be is in right standing with God through the power of Jesus Christ. And that, my friend, is grace. And, 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 and Solomon is praying this prayer to God. Will, will you listen? Will you turn your attention? And even he says, if they're taken away captive to another land, if they turn their face toward Jerusalem, if they turn their heart toward the temple and pray, will you hear their prayer? He makes this great petition to before God, and, and, and he blesses the people and sends them all home, and they go home happy because of this prayer. And that night, God taps him on the shoulder. Solomon, let me, say, let me tell you something. What well, I heard your prayer. Oh, wouldn't that be great? God tell you, I heard your prayer. I heard your prayer. I heard your prayer. And here's what I want you to know. Second Chronicles 7, 14. You know that scripture that we always as Christians throw off on the world? It's not the world. It is God's. If my people. It didn't say nothing about the Congress. It didn't say nothing about the political parties that you may or may not be affiliated with. It didn't say anything about it. It didn't say anything about the whorehouse down the street or the drug house on your block. It didn't say anything. It said, if my people, which are called by my name, those who are hollowed out for my name, if they would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I say it all the time. Sometimes God people have some wicked Turn from their wicked ways. God says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will hear the land. We're always talking about, well, America's in trouble and the world is in trouble. You know the problem is the church doesn't pray. Oh, it's quiet. We build these big buildings, edifices, and, and we, we open them up on a Sunday morning and we say, come in. And then all during the week we shut them down because there's no prayer. You know who really got the answer to this? And, 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 and one people who got the answer to this, because we say we, they don't even know God. Uh, the, 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 the Muslims, because they pray three times a day. They don't close their temple. They don't have prayer. But we say that they don't have the truth. Okay, I'll give you that. Well, I'll tell you who does have the truth. The Catholics. The nuns pray. The monks pray. They keep an excessiveness of prayer. I, I, I visited a, a Catholic a monastery some time ago, and, and, and the nuns was taking us around. I had a, a, a parishioner who had a, a, a sister who's a nun, and we went to have lunch with her, and she toured us through the building, and she said, now this chapel, this chapel, of all the chapels they had, this chapel prays seven times a day, all day long, 24 hours a day. There's somebody in here crying out before God. But we evangelicals, Protestants, we have the truth, and we don't pray. We talk, we write a check, but we don't pray. And the essence of it is, is the house of God ought to be a prayer, a place of prayer. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, my house, you know, when he went into the temple and he overthrew the money changers and, and all them that sold doves and, and, and the temple, and, and is it, wh what are you doing? And who gave you the authority? He says, it is written of all nations, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And I'm going to tell you something. The church is not much different today. We sell everything. We have all kinds of programs. But the prayer program? I mean, have a concert. People will show up. Have a prayer meeting? One or two. That is the essence of the problem that's with the church. And, and, and here are these two men. They go to the temple to pray because the prayer is supposed to happen in the church. Yes, it can happen in your home. Yes, it can happen in the Congress. But let me tell you something. Until the church prays, Congress ain't going to never pray. The White House is never going to pray. The school is never, we are, oh, we got to have prayer in school. You need prayer in the church. Because if the church was praying, prayer would have never been taken out of the school. I don't have to get an amen. I know that's true. Prayer. Prayer. So these two men, they go up to the temple with prayer. And here's the contrast of them as Jesus is teaching them. One, he considers himself self-righteous. I like the narrative in the King James that he prayed to himself. His pseudo kind of prayer. He prayed to himself. He thought he was addressing God, but he wasn't addressing God. He was addressing himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other folk. What pride, what arrogance. And it's back to 2 Chronicles 7, 15. If my people would humble themselves. You see, because praying in, in, in pride 
101 in getting an answer to prayer from God is this. God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. That's the Bible. God resists pride. If you're going to come before God, if I come before God, if any of us come into the presence of God and we are not humble about how we come, I'm telling you right now, God's not listening. He stands there. I thank you that I'm not like other folks. And he has this list, this grocery list of the things that he doesn't do. Of course, he don't confess the things that he has done because all have sinned. And even like the one he has contempt, this, this little guy here, this tax, this IRS deliverer, this, this enemy of the state, this person who, who, who takes my money uh, because he can. This tax collector, this, and you have to understand this in the context, the tax collector in Israel time, he was not collecting taxes for Israel. He was collecting taxes for the Roman government. And so he's considered a traitor. And, and, and we might look upon people, you, God, I'm not like this traitor. This one who's despised his own nation, who's working for the enemy. I'm not like him. And then he has this list of things that he does do. Like five twice a week. I give, I give a, a, a tenth of all my money uh, to, to the church. And I think to myself, those things you have ought to done, but are not left the other undone. He didn't talk about his love. He didn't talk about his compassion. He didn't talk about his generosity to the poor, because like, it was nothing. He didn't talk about the things that really stir the heart of God, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. He didn't talk about any of those things because those things really didn't affect him. And then there's this tax collector, this, this traitor as, he, as he's viewed in the eyes of this self-righteous individual. He, he feels, I am not worthy to even approach the throne. In fact, I'm not even going to look up God. Just have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I am a person, God, that, that I'm not worthy of your love or your compassion, but, but if you would just have mercy on me. If you would extend to me, God, your grace, because, because on my own, I can't make it. On my own, I'm not good enough. The reality of his theology is so online with what Jesus says. He, he, this is the purpose Jesus came into the world, to save sinners. I'm so glad that I'm a sinner. You say, well, pastor, yes, because Jesus came to save me. Hallelujah. And the guilt written of, uh, 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 I imagine that's in his heart that, you know, he, he oh, it's deep, it's deep. I know that I have wronged you. I know, God, that I have offended you. I know that I have done my fellow man wrong. I know that I have not been the person that I ought to be. But, God, please have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said that this man went home justified. In other words, he went home in right standing with God. He went home with the assurance of forgiven. He went home relying on God's mercy and not on his own righteous acts. Not that we ought not to do righteous acts, but even your righteous acts is still a filthy rag. He went home with the attitude that, God, you are merciful. You're kind. You're, you're just. And you extend mercy beyond what we even deserve. He went home justified. I think to myself, well, out of all the guilt that we experience in life, you know, I'm going to be honest with you, religion is full of guilt. I mean, that's how they kept people, you know, locked in for years. We were talking the other day, just a few of us was coming by the office and we were talking the other day. I don't know if you realize it, but there were so many people here in Sunday school, so many kids I mean, kids met everywhere. In the beginning of this, in the beginning of Speedway, United Methodist Church, which is a Methodist church, it, it, kids met everywhere. I mean, it, it, 
and I look at the church that I came from. I came from uh, Christ United Methodist Church in City Gary. Christ United Methodist built a two-story uh, education wing late 1960s, early 70s, because they had so many kids in Sunday school. Hobart First United Methodist Church had 500 kids in Sunday school. They built a three-story education wing, 500 kids in Sunday school. And you say, well, well, where are the kids now, Pastor? Well, they at the mall. They're in NMR sports. They're sitting at home with their video games. They're doing everything. You know what the problem is? The parents, the church, stopped praying. And we stopped giving kids the education of what Jesus said, and we started giving them the education of what the university said. Oh, I'm going to get some letters. But the reality of it is, it's the reason why the church is dying because its lifeblood is prayer. And, 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 and here's the essence. I, I, I like this out of the Old Testament. Ecclesi uh, uh, Leviticus says these words. It says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If it's a plant, it is the, it is the essence of the liquids that flow through it. That, 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 that plant absorbs the, the, the essence of the sun and the rain and, and, and the soil. And, and it is the essence of the liquid that flows through it that gives that plant life. It's your physical body. Take the blood away. You're dead. And the life of the church, the blood of the church, yes, the blood of Jesus covers us. But the blood of the life of the church is prayer. And it's the kind of prayer that we pray with humility. It is the kind of prayer that we would acknowledge God. Yes, we are sinners and we are in need of your grace. Our world is in need of your grace. Our president is in need of your grace. Our Congress is in need of your grace. Our city leaders and city officials are in need of your grace. And our neighbor, God, yes, the one that might not like us because who we are, what color we are, what nationality or what political party we've joined or what is our philosophy, that person's in need of your grace. By the way, God, we're all in need of your grace. So when you pray, here's the question for you. When you pray, see, here's what the Bible says. God gives grace to the humble. And our example is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 2 and 8, Jesus being found in fashion as a man. In other words, he came and took on flesh and blood like if you pinch yourself and you feel it, you pinch Jesus, he'd have felt it too. You talk about you got some hurts. Nobody's ever hurt like that. Jesus hurt just like you. In fact, the Bible says he's tempted and tried in all points as we, yet without sin. And the scripture says in this text, let me just read it to you. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Now you think that you can walk around with pride? Jesus, the son of God, heaven's crown jewel, who sits at the right hand of the Father, humbled himself. In fact, God is a humbling God. He is the God who sits high but looks low. He has compassion. He remembers that we are but dust. God is a humble God and a compassionate God. And if he is that way and we are his creatures, what gives us the right to have arrogance and pride before him? He humbled himself. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, he said, likewise, you younger. Ooh, y'all not going to like this one. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. You can't tell me what to do. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you, old and young, be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares. Because that's what the problem is. We get so caught up in our cares. We get so caught up in our political situation. We get so caught up in what we want to do and what we say, how we feel. Here is what the Bible says. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, he's like a roaring lion. He walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom you should resist steadfast in your face, knowing that the same affliction you think the devil's chasing you, he's chasing us all. The same affliction is accomplished in your brethren. We have to give ourselves to humility. Proverbs tells us 
In Proverbs chapter 6, we find these words, six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Number one on the list, a proud look. I am somebody. You're nobody. I, I am somebody. Let me tell you something. Your pop is flat. Your potato chips is stale. You nobody. God hates a proud look, but he gives grace to the humble. And, and, and you might not be an extortioner or extortionist. You might not be unjust. You might be righteous in your dealings. Maybe not in all, but in most. And, and you may have honored the vows that you have taken. You have never even thought about adultery. I, I doubt that very seriously. Jesus says, if a man looks on a woman, he's committed adultery already in his heart. You might not even be a tax collector. I don't know. Do we have any IRS in here? <laughs> but whatever you are or whatever you're not, God wants humility. And if your prayers are ever going to be answered, if you're ever going to see God respond to what you're crying about, it's going to have to be God, have mercy on me. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, we want to thank you this morning for this word. Prayer, pride, and humility. We pray, God, as we contrast in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own minds, that we begin to pray prayers of humility, prayers that acknowledge you. And, and God, just not acknowledge you wherever we are. Yes, we can talk to you wherever we are, but when we come into the place worship, when we come into the places hallowed out to your name, yes, the physical, geographical building, wherever we may find one, God, that we have prayer. The church that doesn't pray, God, we know dies. It's the lifeblood of every believer. It's, it's that open communication with you, speaking with you and hearing from you, having, having, oh God, this fellowship. We pray this morning, God, that the word were quickened in our hearts that as we pray, as we look to you, as we trust you, you would give us hearts of humility and we would humble ourselves. In Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, if you need to take time with Jesus this morning and he's talking to you, you, you feel free. The altar is open for you and Whatever God wants to speak to your heart, those of you who are watching online, if God is speaking to your heart this morning and cultivating in your spirit a heart and an attitude of humble prayer, may you respond that your prayers might be heard, that God might receive the glory from your life.
challenging you. Invite somebody else into the presence of God. Trust you've experienced worship with me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Be with you.